Prophets Hosea, Joel, Amos. And uh, they have a common theme, even though they, it looks like they preach over about a century or so, mostly to the northern kingdom before the exile to Assyria. And we know that the northern kingdom was really never faithful to Yahweh. Joel is the hardest book to date because he doesn't name any king, he doesn't name any person, he doesn't name any event in common with any other book. So we just honestly don't know exactly when he was preaching. Uh, the only event he mentions is a locust plague. And he likens it to the day of the Lord. That's it. So best guess is somewhere before 700, 852, somewhere, somewhere in that range, and generally to the northern kingdom. Probably the most familiar prophecy in Joel, because it's quoted in the New Testament, is the prophecy of the Spirit. On that day, the day of the Lord, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my Spirit on my sons and my daughters. They will prophesy, they will dream dreams, and that is re-quoted again in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So that is how we know Joel, because he's quoted again. Amos has some people, he uh, is dated around 760 to 750 during the reign of Jeroboam II. This was a time of prosperity and peace. Assyria was still coming up. Babylon isn't around, Egypt is weak, and so it's a time of peace and prosperity, not only in the northern kingdom, but in the southern kingdom. And it seems to be a time when the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. We wouldn't know anything about that, <laughs> would we? And so Amos was living in Judah, and he was called to the northern kingdom, and he prophesied against the oppression of the poor by the rich. The rich had vacation homes while the poor were starving. And they would get their vacation homes by, I'll call it eminent domain, taking over the poor people's house and saying, it's my vacation house now, as soon as I remodel. We wouldn't know anything about that. Would we? Amos also has a vision of the day of the Lord. And the popular thinking in Israel of this, about the day of the Lord, is going to be a great day. Man, God's going to wipe out all the Gentile nations. Israel will be, will be at the top. It's going to be fun. And Amos says, I wouldn't count on it. It's going to be a day of darkness and gloom. It's going to be like going, meeting a lion in your house so you go out and you meet a bear. Mm. Hmm. So the day of the Lord is not going to be such a great day for Israel and Judah. And then finally we have Hosea uh, 750 to 715. The Assyrian exile happens in 722, so he was there. He was warning Israel immediately before Assyria came to conquer them, and he was there afterwards. We think he was one of those allowed to stay in the land, but uh, we're not sure. Uh, as we, know, we know Hosea because he is famous for God's command to go and marry a prostitute. Now, not like the streetwalkers. These were temple prostitutes, so it's not only the sexual unfaithfulness, it is the religious unfaithfulness. And uh, Gomer was her name. She was never faithful to Hosea. And that was supposed to be a picture of the relationship between Israel and God. Israel was never faithful to God, even though they had a covenant to follow God and serve Him. And so his marriage serves as that picture. And even though they live in different times and have some different themes, there is one theme that recurs in all three. It is the theme of return. And as I was thinking about that a few weeks ago when I was looking at this, sermon, I said, that'd be a great thing to get people back to church. Mm. Or at least to invite them. Right? Because God wants us back. These prophets cry out for Israel to return and avoid the coming judgment. And as I think about America, the church in America and our world and the church in our world, I still think we need to come back to God. Amen. We need to return to Him. And I, I, I don't know what your Facebook news feed is like. I, I get all these polls and things from everybody about uh, 
here's so many people believe this and so many people think that. So let me just read you a few little snapshots and, of course, some news headlines. We know the church is filled with scandals. And it's not limited to the Catholic Church, just say Willow Creek. We know there are wolves among the sheep. But some things that come up on the feed, and I didn't verify these, but I trust the source. Gun deaths are now killing more than war casualties. The rate of sexually transmitted diseases has reached new highs and doesn't show any signs of coming down. Racism and sexism are out in the open and applauded or justified. There's division in our nation. There's division in the church. And it's, it's a real division now. It used to be we could just say, well, we'll agree to disagree. Right? We'll get along. Not anymore. If you don't agree with me, there's the door. If you don't like how we're running the country, move to Canada. John says, cool. <laughs> Harsh, chasm, canyon-like division with animosity and acrimony and vitriol. We know it. It's all in the news all the time. There's a new governor, govern, government scandal every week. Someone steps down. Corruption is rampant. And then we look at the church. The average Christian now attends church two times per month and calls that regular attendance. <laughs> and as I've told you before, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Regular attendance is here every Sunday, just in case you wanted to know that. Our current group of teenagers is the least Christian to date. That is frightening. I'll come back to that. People surveyed said they see more of a need for coffee in the morning than reading their Bible. I talked with the Lord about that. I said, you know, if you give me my coffee first, I'll be more alert when I read the Bible second. <laughs> But I think this points to having the coffee without reading the Bible. Is that really our priority? Someone commits suicide every 12 minutes. And that rate is increasing. And the gap between the rich and the poor is the widest ever. And I cite some of those things because when I look at the situation going on, especially in the northern kingdom at this time, it is not that big a stretch to draw parallels to our own nation. We think everything's hunky-dory, don't we? Back then, the, the economy was prospering, people were getting rich, and everything was going well, there's peace all over the place, and what are we hearing? Hey, the stock market's up and employment's down, everything's great! Is that what God says? Is that what God says? Hosea says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, we don't lack knowledge of facts. I bet you all have your cell phone, and if I gave you the Wi-Fi password, you could Google whatever you want right now. We have access to facts and knowledge, but that's not the kind of knowledge Hosea is talking about. Knowledge in the Bible is also talking about relationships. It talks about personal and intimate relationship with God. So when he says through Isaiah, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, they knew what they could know in their world, but they did not know God. And the reason we know they did not know God is by how they act. Jesus said by uh, uh, the fruits of the tree, you will know what kind of tree it is. Amen? Amen. And so my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. Do we know God? Do we just make them up to, uh, to uh, suit our own preferences and beliefs? The one true place where God is revealed is in this book. And we've got to take the description of God that He gives about Himself, not what we want to make up about Him. We need to know God. Even a little stronger is Amos chapter 4. And what's going on in Israel just before... I mark these because there's a lot going on here. But Amos chapter 4, <coughs> verse 6. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me. Are you aware of the hunger problem in Long Branch? I'd give you some time, Erica, but we don't have that much time. There, we served, what, about 40 this week? Just our little food bank served 40. And that's just one in several in town. Uh, 
Sue Amtrak gives the numbers of uh, well over a thousand hungry people Ooh. in this town. I also withheld the rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain and another had none and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink, yet you have not returned to me. The drought in the Midwest and California is amazing, but a few years ago, how dry was it out there? I mean, lakes went all the way down. They couldn't do anything with them. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devour your fig trees, and you have not returned to me. That might be a hint for Joel. I think about that. Last year? Last year, the big wildfires in California, maybe Every two years year. ago, wiped out all those vineyards? Every year. Last year. Last year. Now, who typically buys those expensive bottles of wine? The rich people. So when God wipes out a vineyard, that's not affecting the poor people. That's affecting the rich people. I set plagues among you as I did in Egypt. I killed your young men with a sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. Yet you have not returned to me. Can I say gun violence? There's more. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we look at what God is doing, and I, I confess, I'm an Old Testament kind of literalist. I don't think anything is coincidence. You know, when, God, when these things happen, is it random that that hurricane just hit North and South Carolina, and I'm just going to say for America as a whole, or Houston, or New Orleans, or the wildfires, or whatever else is going on in this country? Is God trying to say something to us? And I wonder if we're trying to, uh, and I'll, I'll go back to it, the scary thing. Our children are leaving the church and the faith. Well, that's scary. As a nation, we lack compassion. We're splitting up families. We don't care about the homeless. We don't care about, we do. On a general scare, scale, if we really cared about the homeless, we'd solve the problem. If we really cared about veterans, we'd solve the problem. But we don't solve those problems. And then not to mention all the other sexual sin, abortion, gun deaths, greed, corruption. Are we all that different from Israel in this time? No. And we think, hey, everything's great. And when I read about all these things that happened to the USA, I say, well, why did God do all of those things to Israel? To bring them back. Yet you have not returned to me. No matter what you have done, no matter how far you have strayed, if you are slopping with the pigs, God wants you back. God wants us to return. And the message of return is consistent in all of these prophets. And not only that we should return, but that if we do return, there is a blessing waiting for us if we will come back. Amen. Joel, in chapter 2, where uh, Kelly read today, tells us how to come back. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. No half-hearted efforts here. We are to love the Lord our God with all heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Return to God with all your heart. Come back to Him. Rend with fasting and weeping and mourning. We have to come confessing our sins. We have to come weeping for our sins. Fasting. Some of us can fast, but that might go to just, uh, that might go to Jesus saying, deny yourselves. Take up your cross and follow Him. Put down now, this is to me. Put down the Facebook, put down the TV, put down whatever distracts you, and serve the living God at that time. Come back to Him. Return. God doesn't want an out white. I told you my tongue was tired. Part of it sometimes. Outward white wash. And notice what He says: Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. And. What is God's essential character? For He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger 
and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. God doesn't want to judge America any more than he wanted to judge Israel in that time. But you know you can get on God's last nerve and you really don't want to get there. Who knows, he may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, great offerings and drink offerings for the Lord. Now think about that. If you have enough to bring a grain offering and enough to bring a drink offering, which by the way was wine, so your vineyard's doing well, then you have not, not only enough to bring back to God, you have enough for yourself. Hmm? Now that's a blessing. I have enough to give to God and enough for my own little thing. God wants us to return. Hosea 14 echoes the same kind of thing. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. We, we kind of talk about that. Our sins separate us from God. But we've got to take that in again. And not just mental assent and say, my sins are my downfall. My sins are separating me from God. How do you return? Verse 2, take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. That's it. Well, that's too simple. I've got to bring a gift. I've got to stop doing what I'm doing. I've got to bring a tithe. I don't mind if you do that. but No. Bring words of confession. And that goes along with our New Testament promise in 1 John. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we want and when we want to return to God, all we need to do is come and confess. Don't hold anything back. Confess everything. Open every dark closet in your life. Let Him shine His holy light on you and let that cleansing power of the blood of Jesus wash it all away. Come back to God. And then we come to Hosea 6 and that gives us another thing. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but He will heal us. He has injured us, but He will bind up our wounds. If we're experiencing all these things, and perhaps as individuals or as a nation, and we know it's God, the only real alternative is that we have to come back to the one who is afflicting us. Not always pleasant. But God is the only one to return. He afflicted us, but He will bind up our wounds. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will restore us that we may live in His presence. There is a blessing. If you will come back, you will be restored. You will be renewed. You will be revived. Let us acknowledge the Lord or know the Lord is uh, the theme in Hosea. Let us press on to know Him. As surely as the sun rises, He will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Let us press on to know Him. Let us press on to have that relationship with Him. Press on by coming back to the Bible and reading it faithfully. I'll say with your morning cup of coffee. How's that? Press on to know Him in prayer. Press on to know Him through faithful church attendance. Press on to know Him in faithful service. Press on to know Him in faithful stewardship. In every way, God wants us to come back. No half-hearted efforts. Return with all your being. And if we do not, Hosea has, I'm sorry, it's like Amos has the morning. Prepare to meet your God. And you know, as Christians, I'm kind of like, I'm prepared, praise the Lord, Jesus saved me. I'm looking forward to it in that way, but I don't think that's what Amos means in this passage to you. Prepare to meet your God. The people of Israel did not return, they did not repent, they kept on in their sinful ways. And in 722, Assyria came in, conquered them, slaughtered thousands, they met their God. You would think Judah would have learned a lesson. But by 587, they had not repented, they had not returned, and the Babylonians came in, burnt down Jerusalem, exiled many, and slaughtered thousands. They met their God. And what makes us think we shall escape judgment? Are we prepared to meet the God we so glibly say we know? Now is the time to return. 
And I would say you have many ways you can return. Just come back. Just start attending. Just start reading. You lots of ways to come back. But there's only one way to prepare to meet your God. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and ask for forgiveness. You have to confess your sins that He will cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. That is the only way to be prepared to meet God. And we all have that appointment coming sooner or later. Are you prepared to meet your God? Confess your sins and rend your heart. Stop the pretense. Stop the excuses. You know, if you want to return, you've been a Christian, rend your heart. Come back. Recommit your life to Jesus and say, Lord, no more fooling around, no more excess, no more making excuses. I'm back, and please take me back. And what does it say? Return to me, and I will come back to you. I do believe that parable. God comes out when we're a long way off, gives us a big hug, and escorts us back into the house of God. Are you ready to return? Return by coming back to church. Return by living your life according to His teaching and not our own opinions and preferences. And there is still time. As long as you are alive, there's still time to come back to God. And you know, as, as much as this wrath of God is coming, He reminds us that's not His essential nature. He is a loving and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents in bringing calamity. He doesn't want to bring judgment and calamity. He wants to bring blessing. But we need to come back to God. Where are you? Do you need to be renewed? Do you need to be revived? Would you like a blessing from God? Come back. Return to Him. Put your faith in Jesus. Come back. Recommit your life to God. Come back. And know the blessing that God has for you. Let us pray.